Alright, this lab video is going to co cover fluid compartments and fluid and electrolyte balance. So looking at this page in your notes packet, in your lab packet, we're on page 91. So if you want to turn to that to follow along. Um, looking at fluid compartments. So if we look at how the body fluid is distributed across the body, we can see that um, most of it is inside of our cells. We've talked about this before in class, mostly at the beginning of the semester, but about 63% is found inside of our cells, 37% is found outside of our cells, and where that 37% um, is distributed is we have some of that, most of it, in the interstitial fluid, so that's the fluid between cells. Um, some of it is in the plasma, that's in the blood vessels, and the rest of it would be lymph fluid and transcellular fluid, which means it's outside cells, um, but it's not in a vessel. So cerebral spinal fluid, synovial fluid, which bathes our joints, and serous fluid that we find you know, between the, the membranes, visceral and parietal membranes. So those are examples all of extracellular fluid. So if we look at our PowerPoint and look at how fluid is distributed, again we can see that most of the water in our body is found inside cells. So 40% of the body weight is inside cells. So your lab gives you um, an example of a person. We know that 60% of the body weight, um, for 55 to 60% of body weight in males is water. And for women, it's 45 to 55%. So know those numbers um, of total body water for men and women. And then if we know that 60% um, of that is found inside cells, we could just do a simple calculation if, as long as we know what the body weight of that individual is. So looking at that, we could see that um, of uh, total body weight, 55 to 60% is water, so we know that if someone weighs 150 pounds, we could calculate 55 to 60% of that would be about 41 kilograms of total body water. And that we know most of it would be inside cells, two-thirds or about 60%, and one-third would be outside of cells. And we could make a simple calculation. So looking at that, going back to our PowerPoint, um, again, um, most of the fluid outside of our cells is in the interstitial fluid. Some of it is in the plasma, um, but together these make up extracellular fluid, which is about 20% of your body weight. Again, most of it is inside cells. So going back to our objectives then, um, looking at the major solutes in each fluid compartment, well we've, talking, we've been talking about this um, all semester as well. If we look at where we find specific ions, this chart shows pretty much everything we've talked about in terms of uh, major locations. So if blue is the interstitial fluid, we know that uh, the primary electrolytes we find outside of our cells include sodium, chloride, bicarbonate ion, and calcium. Those are the major ones we've talked about this semester that are found in higher concentration outside of our cells. Electrolytes that we find inside of our cells include potassium, magnesium, hydrogen phosphate, sulfate, and protein anions. And in looking at the protein anions, we know that we do see um, a good number of those um, in the plasma as well, because remember that um, the liver, the job of the liver is to make many of our plasma proteins and then distribute them to the blood. But they're too large to slip out of the capillaries, so they shouldn't be found in high amounts in the interstitial fluid. So the proteins are found in higher concentration inside cells, because that's where proteins are made, and then as they are uh, released from the cell, they do enter the plasma where they're carried and remain in the vasculature. So they're not out in the interstitial fluid in high amounts. So um, looking at the forces that, are, that help move things in and out of our cells, we've talked about some of these. We've talked about hydrostatic pressure, we've talked about osmotic pressure, remember that hydrostatic pressure pushes fluid out of a space and osmotic pressure sucks fluid into a space due to the solutes that are present there. So things that would move 
fluid out of circulation, which means out of blood vessels, that would be the hydrostatic pressure in the capillary and the osmotic pressure in the interstitial fluid. Something that would move fluid into our vessels, <coughs> that would be the opposite. That would be osmotic pressure in the capillary. That would be our plasma protein sucking fluid in and the hydrostatic pressure in the interstitial fluid, which would be pushing on the outside of the capillary, bringing fluid into the capillary. And then looking at what would move uh, fluids in and out of cells, well that really depends upon um, diffusion. So when we look at uh, diffusion of fluid, that specifically water, that's osmosis. So it's just concentration of solutes in water on either side of the membrane that's going to drive movement of water in and out of cells. So osmosis is the means of transport of water across plasma membranes. When we look at movement into lymphatic vessels, remember that depends on how much interstitial fluid there is pushing on the outer walls of our lymphatics. So therefore, the more edema someone has, the more you're going to see in the lymphatic vessels or the more we compress that space, say with exercise um, or just wrap, wrapping an ace wrap or putting a TED hose on an individual's lower extremities. That's going to help push that fluid into the lymphatics. So specifically, it's hydrostatic pressure in the interstitial fluid that's going to move fluid into the, or into the lymphatics. When we talk about what moves solutes between compartments, that's different than water. So we talked about what moves water, but when we talk about mo moving what moves solutes, that's based on concentration gradients. So for number four, when we look at how solutes move across plasma membranes, we talked about that this semester, like when you look at glucose, glucose comes across the plasma membrane by facilitated diffusion. It also can come across through secondary active transport. But primarily the main processes are diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and active transport. That's how solutes can move across plasma membranes because many of our solutes, remember, are water soluble, so they can't just diffuse across that fatty inner core of the plasma membrane. They require some type of transporter in the case of active transport or facilitated diffusion. Movement in and out of circulation, that's talking about moving things in and out of our blood vessels. So we talked about, again, that's going to depend upon um, concentration gradients on either side and also these pressures, so this bulk flow that occurs, those hydrostatic you know, pressures. But what actually moves solutes from point to point is going, again, to be diffusion. So just high concentration to low concentration. The next term talks about osmolality and how do we define osmolality. Well, osmoli osmolality is defined on the next page down here as the number of solute particles dissolved in a kilogram of water. So we express that value. A normal osmolality would be 285 to 300 milliosmoles per kilogram of water. So that's what the, basically the concentration of our body fluid should be. So if we look at the plasma, we should see the, um, a concentration of solutes in there of about 285 to 300. If that number increases, if we have a high osmolality, that means we have more solutes compared to water, and that would be a sign of dehydration. If we have a low osmolality, say something less than 285, that means we have more water than solutes, and that would be a sign of fluid overload. Let's say somebody left the IV pump running too long. So that's a sign that someone um, does not have enough solutes in their blood. So we want to make sure we correct those things. And there's different IV fluids that you'll learn about that help correct differences in osmolality. So just think of that as the concentration, how concentrated the plasma is. So moving back then, um, we talked about movement in and out of these different compartments. We talked about movement of solutes, um, osmolality, and then lastly, when we see changes in electrolytes, and electrolytes are the ions that we, see, with, that we should see distributed in our plasma. When we see changes in that, we assign different names depending on the electrolyte we're talking about. So someone with hyponatremia, hypo means low, so if we're looking at the different levels, someone with hyponatremia would have a level less than 135. So hyponatremia is low sodium. The, the word natremia comes from natrium, and that's the Latin term for sodium. That's why sodium's pre, um, symbol is Na to stand for natrium. So 
hyponatremia refers to sodium, low sodium. Hypernatremia would be high sodium. Um, hypokalemia, again, uh, that's uh, Latin for potassium is calium, so that's where the K comes from. So low potassium is hypokalemia, and high potassium would be hyperkalemia. We see hypokalemia quite often, quite often in the elderly because they're on diuretics for blood pressure, and it causes them to lose potassium in their urine. So we often see people coming in with, um, you know, abnormal heart rhythms and weakness due to uh, low potassium levels. Because we know these ions are important in muscle contraction and nerve conduction. Hypocalcemia would be low ca blood calcium and hypercalcemia would be high blood calcium. That one kind of speaks for itself. And then chloride levels, those are mostly related to sodium because sodium and chloride kind of go together as they move across the membrane. So if someone has low sodium, they're also typically going to have low chloride. But we call that hypochloremia and hyperchloremia depending on the levels of chloride. So you're going to see, you know, patients with these electrolyte imbalances, and there's different things we watch for in those patients, and there's different foods we can recommend or, or not recommend based on what those levels are. And our kidneys do a great job in helping with electrolyte and fluid imbalances. For example, we have a couple of different hormones. Aldosterone is one um, that is secreted by the renal cortex, and it promotes the kidneys to reabsorb sodium from the urine back to the blood and also to secrete potassium into the urine. So if we have low blood pressure, uh, we will hold back sodium because we know water follows salt. So when there's low blood pressure, the kidneys um, are enabled to reabsorb sodium through the hormone aldosterone, which is secreted again by the adrenal cortex. So think of that the kidneys retain sodium uh, with the help of aldosterone. Atrial natriuretic peptide hormone, or ANP it's called, that one promotes sodium secretion into the urine. So when someone has too high of a blood pressure, the walls of the atria are stretched and stimulated to release ANP, or atrial natriuretic hormone, and that will cause sodium to be secreted from the blood into the urine, and we know that water follows salt, so water will follow that sodium and blood pressure will go down. Another hormone for electrolyte balance is parathyroid hormone. When we uh, have low blood calcium, parathyroid hormone will uh, be stimulated to increase in its um, concentration in the blood, and that will cause more calcium reabsorption in the nephron and from the intestine, so we can increase those blood calcium levels. So moving on to the worksheet then that reviews these concepts, if we're looking at um, this matching assignment here, um, number one, percent of extracellular fluid in the body, we know that there's more inside cells than outside cells, so the answer for this would be D, we have, I'm sorry, A, sorry, extracellular fluid, there's less of that, so 37%. And we know that CSF and synovial fluids we talked about are transcellular fluids, so that would be letter W. Those are um, kind of special areas that are not inside cells or inside plasma or between cells. And then uh, the name of the fluid inside of our cells we talked about, that is an example of intracellular fluid, letter B and the main force pushing water out of capillaries we said was C, blood hydrostatic pressure. And sources of intake, if we look at where we get our water from, if we look at this picture here, where does water come from? Well, from three major sources. We produce a little water with metabolism, if you remember that from the electron transport chain, part of aerobic metabolism. Some of it we get in our foods and most of it in beverages. So if we want to limit someone's fluid in their vessels, we are going to limit their beverages. That's number one. So um, a majority is through food and, and beverages, and then we lose fluid in these ways. A majority we can see is by urine. The next is through the skin and lungs through breathing, and then a small amount through feces and sweat. So if you had the diarrhea, obviously you would lose more through the feces route because you have too much water in there that was not meant to be lost by the body through feces. So going back to this, then the major sources of 
body water intake would be letter N, food, and letter P, beverage. Name of the fluid inside lymphatic vessels, we call that lymph. Percent of intracellular fluid in the body is D, 63%. Most of it is found inside cells. The main force returns interstitial fluid to the blood. That is going to be the blood colloid osmotic pressure. Remember we have the plasma protein albumin that will pull fluid into the capillary, so that's that osmotic pressure sucking fluid in from the interstitial fluid, so that's letter T. Fluid compartment with increased sodium chloride and bicarbonate ion, remember that is the uh, interstitial fluid outside of our cells, letter H. And the main force that moves water in and out of cells, uh, we have the cell colloid osmotic pressure, and that's letter G, and we have cell hydrostatic pressure. So depending again on the amount of solutes inside or outside the cell, as well as the amount of fluid inside and outside cells. The name of fluid between cells, we talked about that quite a bit this semester, that's interstitial fluid. And a hormone that promotes water conservation, that's the antidiuretic hormone. That's the hormone secreted by the posterior pituitary that causes the collecting duct to reabsorb water, therefore preventing it from entering the urine and keeping blood pressure up. Major source of water output is urine. Majority of our fluid is lost as urine. The fluid compartment with increased potassium, phosphate, and protein, that is the intracellular fluid. Those are ions found in higher concentration inside the cell. And fluids with increased protein, that would be letter S. The plasma, we know, has increased protein. And also the intracellular fluid, because cells make protein. So that would make sense they would be in higher concentration there. Other lesser sources of water output, that would be um, our stool and perspiration. So feces, letter R, and perspiration, letter M. Another source of new body water, um, outside of food and beverage, that would be water from metabolism. We produce a little bit of water just by breaking down glucose and making ATP. A hormone that reduces reabsorption of sodium. So that would be uh, that hormone that is secreted when we have too high of a blood pressure. That's the atrial natriuretic hormone. And the general name of fluid found outside cells, again, that is looking at inter or I'm sorry general name so that's extracellular fluid that's just a general term so that would include plasma and interstitial fluid so that's letter F and fluid that or force that moves fluid into the lymphatic system well the more interstitial fluid we have pressing on the walls that surround it the higher or the more push out of that area so that's going to push on the outer walls of the lymphatic vessel and force that excess fluid into the lymphatics to return it to the general circulation. Hormones stimulating sodium and potassium reabsorb sodium reabsorption and potassium secretion, again that's that aldosterone secreted by the adrenal cortex. And the name of fluid in the circulatory system, which is in the vascular system, we just call that plasma, letter S. So these are really, really good terms that you should know, um, not only for our lab, but also for the next lecture exam on the renal system, because all of these um, are examples of renal physiology and ways that we control blood pressure through our kidneys. The diagram below wants you to color in the extracellular fluid, so that would be the fluid inside the capillary as well as the fluid between cells. And then it wants you to draw arrows from these titles showing what direction it makes fluid move. So we know blood capillary hydrostatic pressure will push fluid out of the capillary, so you should have an arrow moving out. And then we have interstitial fluid osmotic pressure that would push fluid into the interstitial fluid, so we should have another arrow coming out of the capillary for this one. And then we have blood capillary colloid osmotic. That's due to plasma proteins in the plasma sucking fluid in. So we want to draw an arrow going into the capillary. And then interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure. That's going to push fluid into the lymphatics. And it's also going to push fluid into the capillary. So you have two different arrows here originating from this type of pressure into lymphatics and into the capillary.
And then the back side just has us look at different uh, terms related to electrolyte balance. So we know osmolality is defined as the concentration of solutes in the extracellular fluid. Hypochloremia is referring to chlorine and it's low, so that would be letter K, chloride ion. Hypernatremia, hyper means high, natrine, natrine refers to sodium, so this is high sodium, letter J. Hyperkalemia, we have high potassium, so that's letter A. Hypocalcemia, hypo means low, calcemia means calcium, so that's letter M, low calcium. Acidemia, acidosis, well this is something that we need to know the normal blood pH, which is 7.35 to 7.45. So the lower the pH, the more acidic. So anything less than 7.35 is acidemia or acidosis. So that would be a pH of 7.33. Hypocapnia, if you remember that from the respiratory system, capnia refers to carbon dioxide. So we have low carbon dioxide, letter F. And this might be obtained, say, from a blood gas, because it's talking about the partial pressure of uh, carbon dioxide. And alkalosis will be any pH that's greater than 7.45, so that would be letter C. And that concludes the uh, lab on fluid and electrolyte balance. The next worksheet, as far as introducing new material, the next worksheet looks at case studies. So now we're going to apply this information. So if we read the first case study, we have Jack Daniels. That tells you something right there. Was admitted to the hospital to complications from liver failure brought on by chronic alcoholism. His skin is yellow. His abdomen is distended. He has edema. He cut himself and he couldn't get the bleeding to stop. And after further exam, you can see he had this swollen abdomen due to excess peritoneal fluid called ascites. And everything else from the blood sample and other tests are, are included here. So here's the normal range, what we should see in a healthy person. And here's what he got in his results. So first of all, what term can be used to describe the yellowish color to his skin? Call that jaundice. And what substance is responsible for that color, that would be the bilirubin. Bilirubin is uh, produced as a result of breaking down red blood cells. We notice his bilirubin is 7.4. It should be 0 to 1.3. Bilirubin is normally uh, recycled by the liver, but if the liver is not working properly, bilirubin builds up in the blood and is responsible for that yellow color. Newborns often, because of their immature liver, will get what's called newborn jaundice in the first week or two after birth, and that usually resolves on its own, or some babies need to go under special lights to break down the bilirubin under the UV light of the <coughs> special bassinet. So uh, which lab value confirms this? That's the total bilirubin. And how is that produced in the body? We talked about as a result of breaking down red blood cells, because red blood cells have a limited lifespan. And it's accumulating because his liver is not uh, conjugating and recycling that bilirubin. GGT and AST, these are all, you can see they end in ACE, so they are enzymes, they're actually liver enzymes. And because his liver is damaged, the cells are damaged, those enzymes are leaking out into the plasma, building up in the blood, and not being you know, contained inside the liver cells. So that's why uh, those are elevated. And he has a bleeding disorder. How do we know he has a bleeding disorder? Because if we look at the prothrombin time, the PT, that is an indication of how long bleeding occurs before clotting takes place or coagulation. So normal is 11 to 15 seconds. We should see a clotting or coagulation. His takes 16 seconds. So he has a bleeding disorder, again, because the liver is in charge of making those proteins for uh, stopping the bleeding, like fibrinogen. So therefore he has a liver disorder, he's going to have a bleeding disorder. His colloid osmotic pressure is elevated, or, or is it, sorry, is it elevated, depressed, or unchanged? Well, colloid osmotic pressure, if you think about his liver's not making protein, and proteins contribute to blood colloid osmotic pressure, therefore we would expect that that's going to be lower than normal because there's not enough proteins being produced by the liver to pull that fluid into the liver. So we would expect it to be depressed, the blood colloid osmotic pressure. And how do we know that is true? 
Well, if we look at his albumin, it's 2.8. That's the major protein that holds fluid in the vessels and is produced by the liver. His value is 2.8. Normal range is 6.4 to 8.3, so he doesn't have enough albumin, and that would cause a decrease in the blood colloid osmotic pressure. So his peritoneal compartment, the abdominal area, contains all this fluid. What major fluid compartment is this part of? Well, again, that would be the extracellular fluid, interstitial fluid. And is there any information from the physical exam that supports fluid excess in the same major compartment? Well, he has edema. So he has uh, not only that, but he has generalized edema. So he's going to have fluid, extra fluid in his hands and his feet, all because of not having enough albumin to hold that fluid in his vascular space inside the vessels. So review blood flow, thinking about blood flow through the abdomen and the forces involved, discuss the factors that explain the fluid shift. Well again, he has in less blood colloids, colloid osmotic pressure, low albumin, so therefore he's going to have um, less pull, less suck into of fluid into his blood vessels and more leaking out into the interstitial fluid. Um, which of the lab tests are normal and what does that tell us? Well, if I look at these, we can see that um, blood pressure is elevated, um, hematocrit is low, um, white blood cells are normal, so that tells us that he does not have an infection. So all of these other uh, data here that are abnormal are the result of um, lifestyle choice and the you know, alcohol abuse and then the resulting liver damage. All right, so next case study is uh, a baby. She's a year old. She comes in. She's pale, lethargic. She's been having vomiting and diarrhea, and she's had a fever and her respiratory rate and pulse are increased. So the doctor orders the following tests. Right away in looking at this we can see osmolality is high. Normal should be 285 to 300. Sodium is low. Potassium is low. Chloride is low. Specific gravity of the urine is high. pH is within the normal range of urine. A little watery um, and it's positive for ketones. So the history provided by the um, mother is vomiting and diarrhea at home with fever. And what are we seeing uh, upon admission? She's pale and lethargic. So we know that she's definitely affected by this um, vomiting and diarrhea. So if we look at the asmolality, asmolality, lality, sorry, we're looking at the concentration of solutes, so her osmolality is too high, indicating dehydration. So if we look at um, what we know, what's in the intestines, which are all of our electrolytes, um, which of these were reported in her blood tests? So again, she lost sodium and potassium through vomiting and diarrhea. And what specific terms would describe that? Well, we would say that she has hyponatremia and hypokalemia and hypochloremia. Would she be at risk for acid base? Well, if she is vomiting, she would lose her um, hydrogen ion, because that's found in stomach fluid, you know, uh, stomach contents, so she could be at risk for um, loss of acid. And di diarrhea, bicarbonate ion, is found, is reabsorbed in the large intestine, so diarrhea can cause you to lose bicarbonate ion. So it would depend which one was worse, the vomiting or the diarrhea, that would put her at ras risk for either acidosis or alkalosis. So we see a shift uh, fluid from the intercellular to extracellular fluid and discuss the general problem with this fluid shift. Well, we know that our cells need fluid to function, so if we lose fluid from the inside of our cells to the outside of our cells, um, the nervous system, um, the enzymes create that are necessary for metabolism don't have that fluid medium to do their work in and as a result of that uh, cell function goes down and that's why people become very lethargic when they are dehydrated. So which one puts her at risk for developing an arrhythmia, an abnormal heart rate? Well we find that potassium particularly is um, affects heart rhythm. So this low potassium is something we'd want to really hit hard and make sure that we 
get that within the normal range. So usually we can do that with just a simple potassium supplement. They just take a drink a special liquid that brings potassium up. Okay, so what hormone might be increased that could be helping her correct her sodium imbalance? Well, we talked about a hormone that helps us to retain sodium, and that's aldosterone from the adrenal cortex. That's the, the gland that sits on top of the kidney. It's actually part of the endocrine system. It's not part of the renal system. But again, it's aldosterone. And that concludes our discussion of fluid and electrolyte balance. We'll pick up next time with acid and base balance.